Here's one more example. Suppose t of n is equal to a n squared plus b n plus c, where a, b, and c are constants, and a is in particular a positive constant. We can claim that t of n is theta of n squared. And we can claim this because there do exist constants c1 and c2 such that t of n can be sandwiched between c1 n square and c2 n square. Now what values of c1 and c2 can we choose to show this? Well, if you look at the dominant term over here, the dominant term is a n square and it has a constant of a. So if we choose c1 to be a minus 1, And if we choose C2 to be A plus 1, then we find that T of n can be sandwiched between C1 times n square and C2 times n square. T of n is greater than or equal to A minus 1 times n square, and T of n is less than or equal to A plus 1 times n square beyond a certain point. Now, what is that point? Let's try to see. So when is when does T of n um, overtake or when is T of n higher than a minus one times n square? So in other words, when is a n square plus b n plus c greater than or equal to a minus 1 times n square. We are trying to find out what is that value, what is that threshold value beyond which we can say that t of n is above the curve for a minus 1 times n square. Well, if we if we bring this term on the left hand side and combine it with a n square, so a n square minus a minus 1 times n square is going to be n square. So we want to find out when n square is greater than or equal to minus bn minus c. Now if b and c are also positive constants, this is going to be a negative number. And so n square is always going to be larger than minus bn minus c. And if b is a negative number, then minus b will be positive. But still, we can um, we can identify a point beyond which n square is going to be greater than or equal to minus b and minus c. So that value won't be at zero. Perhaps it may be at some finite number larger than zero. But because n square is growing much faster than this linear expression there will be a point of intersection where n square will be greater than or equal to minus b n minus c because if you look at this quadratic expression n square plus b n plus c we know that this expression is going to have two roots on the number line and if you remember your quadratic equations from high school because the the because the coefficient of n square is greater than 0, the expression for n square plus bn plus c is going to be an upward facing parabola. So in this particular region, greater than the value of the second root of this equation, the, the parabola is going to be greater than, uh, is going to be higher than 0. The value of n square plus bn plus c when n is larger than the second root is going to be positive. So we, we can say for sure, therefore, that n squared plus bn plus c is going to be greater than zero for large values of n, for large enough values of n beyond a certain point. In other words, n squared will always be greater than or equal to minus bn minus c. Or in other words, a n square plus b n plus c will always be greater than or equal to a minus 1 times n square 
for large enough values of n. So we know that this is always going to be true for large n. What about the other side of the inequality? p of n is less than or equal to a plus 1 times n squared. When does this hold? Well, again, if we take p, if we take a n squared on the other side, a plus 1 times n squared minus a n squared is going to be n squared. And again, if we bring bn plus c also on the right hand side, we are going to have n squared minus bn minus c being greater than or equal to 0. That's what this inequality will change to. So when is n squared minus bn minus c greater than or equal to 0? Is, is it going to be greater than or equal to 0 as n goes towards infinity? Well, yes. Again, the, the curve for n squared minus bn minus c is going to be an upward facing parabola because the value of the coefficient here is positive. And so, once we cross a threshold value, which is the value of the second root of this equation, we are going to end up with a value for the function that is most definitely greater than zero. By the way, it's also possible that uh, whether we look at this expression or this expression, it's possible that the curve could have a single root, or it's possible that the curve could have no root. It depends on you know what these values of coefficients are over here. So in either case, we know that as we increase the value of n to a very large value, this expression is going to be greater than 0. It's already greater than 0 in, you know, when there are no roots to the equation. It's going to be greater than 0 when we cross this value of n, which is the value where this, this is a single root. And this will be a single root when this is a perfect square, when this can be expressed as a perfect square. But in general, there will be two roots to this equation. And when we increase the value of n beyond the value of the second root, we know that n square minus bn minus c will be greater than or equal to 0. In other words, we know that p of n will be less than or equal to a plus 1 times n square. So if we choose a value of n that is greater than both the thresholds, the threshold for this inequality and the threshold for this inequality, so if n rise, if n is the if the value of n is taken beyond both these thresholds, greater than both these thresholds, then both these inequalities are going to hold beyond that point. So this means that p of n can always be sandwiched between c1 n square and c2 n square for some value of the threshold. So that value can, will in general be some n naught, which will depend on the values of these coefficients a, b, and c. And that's the reason why p of n is equal to theta of n squared, because we have shown that it can be sandwiched between two constant multiples of n squared.